So welcome all. And of course, we have our friend, Mr. Paul Lilly with us. And we're going to get started by um, trying to do a little bit of a reminder from the uh, first module of doing the names of the strings and the exercise for the chromatic scale, which it chromatic scale exercise is like a spider exercise. It really helps your finger coordination, your picking coordination, and it gets you to know the notes at the top of the neck. So for that, I'm going to let Baldemar do that demonstration for y'all and take it away, Baldemar. All right, so we're going to review our strings, of course. So the, they're going to start from the bottom, one, all the way up to six. And then our string names, I remember them by going down, which is E, A, D, G, B, and then E again. There is an acronym that I use to, to remember those, which is Eddie, A, Dynamite, Goodbye, Eddie. And that's working its way down. David, and, you had a good one. Well, someone else oh, may want to share theirs. Mine, mine was the same, except it's Elvis ate dynamite. Goodbye, Elvis. But we had a, uh, we had another uh, student last week that was he had an acronym that I forgot that was basically the the strings backwards. Yeah, that right. was like the Easter little Bunny. e to the biggie. Yeah, that was the Easter Bunny gets drunk at Easter. That's oh, right. Yeah. It was Ken. Yeah. I mean, that's how I learned it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, if you could um, show the finger numbers, and uh, we'll start on that chromatic scale and that's why right. it's important to know where those finger numbers are at. And so our hand, our, our fingers are numbered, so it's going to be one, two, three, four, and T. Our thumb is usually the letter T. And it goes behind the neck right here, the thumb. All right, so the way I remember is that each one of the fingers is going to be taking care of each one of the frets. So our chromatic scales can be played on e either one of the strings, and it can also be played down. So open E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. And then again, we start all over. After the G sharp, we've got the A, A sharp, B, C, and then we start over again. C sharp, D, D sharp, and E. That's our chromatic scale on the E string up here now on the guitar. Okay, now show it on just the top. Using then, just the four frets, using all the strings. And then working our way down, it's going to be. And you do it backwards too, Baldemar? And then we do it backwards. We start from the pink, from the pinky. Nice job, nice job. And the way I now, practice, and the way I practice it is by the first strum is down on the string, and then up, just like that. Up, alternating, down. alternating your pick. Alternating. Very my good. Pick. All right. Uh, any uh, questions on that? Everybody's got it. Also, well, I wanna, we, also I want to oh. point out that posturing. Uh, it's on the lesson here. It's posturing is very important. You need to, you know, have a good position sitting down. Your guitar on your lap, nice and comfortable. And then in a position to where you can be able to maneuver your fingers up here. And then you want to relax. Down. You want to relax your shoulder. Get good and relaxed. 
so that you're feeling you're not feeling tense the ten more tense you are the more apt that you're liable to try to press down really hard so you want to be really relaxed try to keep your back straight up and i actually am a i like mine over my left knee which is the classical guitar style and Baldemar is demonstrating the folk guitar style. <laughs> I was just going to say with this chromatic scale, for those of you that are instructors, uh, as well as if you're an, a student tackling this, when you first learn this, and the reason we give this to you right out of the gate, along with the chords that you learn, obviously you're working on calluses and you're working on fretting, and it involves all four fingers, which is good. And what we want you as a student to be looking for as you're going through this, think of it like we teach you in week one and then next week and next week, you, we keep it in your routine, your practice routine. What we say to you is, as you're going through, the first goal as you're working on your calluses is nice, clean, good notes. And listen to where, when you play that scale from the top, uh, the low E string down towards the floor, the way Baltimore showed the second time, See if there's any tendencies that you have as a player. And common ones tend to be, you know, the two weakest fingers tend to be your pinky and your third finger, plus your pinky stretch in there. Or when you switch strings, that might throw it off a little bit. So even out of the gate, um, we're trying to get the student to be analyzing their own practice of this. And then from week to week, the instructor could start adding things on top of that chromatic scale. So week two, it might be introducing what Baldemar said is, all right, now with your pick, because if you don't tell them the first time they do it, they'll probably just do down strums. But you might tell them, practice it now with alternate picking. And that's kind of the tidy movement that we're going to be doing when we go to strumming. And then at some point, I don't usually do this out of the gate. You can, but at some point, have them practice it with the metronome because what you want to try and do with the chromatic scale is get it to be musical. Now, the chromatic scale isn't the most musical scale, but by musical, we mean if you're playing along with the metronome and you're able to time your fretted notes with the clicks, even when you're switching strings and then coming back up, that's kind of putting it all together to getting them ready for when they start learning, say, the G major scale or another scale. And it starts to get you, because we introduced the metronome, it starts to get you into rhythm and timing. So there's a lot of different ways, even though we teach you the chromatic scale, your very first lesson, there's ways as an instructor or as a student, you could be building on that from week to week to week in your practice routine. And it's, it's important to remember to start slow. like that and then build up on your speed you can start on your first string practice on your first string and then work your way down on the second third fourth fifth and sixth string do two strings at a time and then add a third string add a fourth string and then just keep adding strings that you get better sounds good now we get to start moving on so we're going to start learning how to read a chord diagram and i'm going to bring that up for us <laughs> all right Reading a chord diagram, it's fairly simple. You got the lines that are laid out just like your vertical lines that are laid out just like your guitar strings. And you'll notice it says right there, E, A, D, G, B, E. And then it's going to show the fret wires. You'll have your first, second, and third fret. Okay? Now, also remember that sometimes you're going to see, uh, I'm, I may be going ahead of myself. Um, I don't see a good diagram here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tom gave me these. Uh, where you have the circles at the top, these are going to be your open strings. And then you're going to have the finger suggestions and where they fret, where you're going to position your fingers on the frets. Okay. Um, did I miss anything yet, fellas? <laughs> mm, no, just remember that that thicker bar at the very top there, that's going to be your nut. That should be like the a nut. reference point. Right. You use that as a reference point and then work your way down, fret one, fret two, and then fret three. Good point. 
Now, as we said before, you have your finger numberings, one, two, three, and four, and they will correspond on the chord diagrams to show you where you want to, where the chord position is, the notes are for the chords that you're making. So <laughs> should you happen to go above the fifth fret, you'll have a note, a, a symbol right here or a number that'll show you that you're on the fifth fret or the corresponding frets thereafter. So and you're not guessing also, where you got to be. Then, then it's also important to point out that that uh, the nut right there is letting you know where the uh, the headstock would be at. This if, right here, yes. That's a reference. That would be a reference point. The, the thick so, bar. So if I could, if I could, if go ahead. You scroll down to the next line. You see the chord chart right there on the di on those diet. No, if you scroll back up. You'll notice how that chord chart, it doesn't have a double line on the top of it. If you're looking at a chord chart that's describing chords that are not using the first three frets that are fretted farther down on the neck of the guitar, it'll look like that. And on the right side of the chord chart, if you're using a lot of popular apps, there'll be a slight dash and then it will say two FT for second fret or five SFT for the fifth fret. And that's just to let you know um, where it is that you're looking at on the guitar for those three threat, three frets that you're looking at at that current moment for that chord chart. But going forward in these, these first few beginner chords, you guys don't have to worry about that. All of our basic chords, they're all within the first three frets. So we're good for now. Very good. All right. So we're going to learn these two chords today. And it's the E minor and the A sus2. The reason we use these is that it basically they will help you for transitioning later on when we get into the bigger chords. And it'll show you, we'll show you uh, as that goes, as we go on, how that actually works. But for now, let's work with the E minor and the A sus. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing here. And David, can you, uh, would you mind demonstrating the E minor and the A sus2, boss? All right. So when we're looking at our E, uh, looking at our E minor chord, we're looking at the fifth string on your guitar, which is that second, the thickest string on the second fret. So one, two on the second fret, fifth string. And then we're looking at the fourth string, which is right below it on the second fret. And that is your E minor chord. And that is E minor. So then we look at our next chord, the A sus2. Well, good news. It is literally moving your two fingers down one string. That is your E sus2 or your A sus2 chord. That is on your third string and fourth string. And that's how they'll play your first two chords. Now, real quickly, uh, Kathy brought up a good question that does get mentioned a lot, which is we talked about what an open string is. What is an open chord? Kathy, an open chord is when you play a chord without barring, barring the chord using one finger to hold down all the chords. They'll hold down all the strings. So this uh, E minor chord, that's an open chord. This A sus2 chord, that's an, uh, that's an open chord too. But if you're playing like was traditionally like an F chord, where you have to bar it, tr the traditional version of an F chord, that would not be an open chord. That would be a bar chord. So just a terminology that comes up that you guys should know about. But uh, other than that, Dan, where do you want to go All from right. here? So, so, so it's, it's, it's important to point out that when you have the E minor fretted, you play all the strings. And that will be illustrated, hopefully, in the chord chart that you're yeah, looking the at. Chord chart. By having all either zeros. And then yeah. on the A sus, you only play from the fifth string down. And the sixth string will have, normally have an X on there. So look for that. That way you can start practicing correctly. And there, I'll bring and there, that. 
Yeah, and there's Go reasons ahead. for that too. Um, when you're playing the A, uh, the E minor, not to get too crazy into it, but you're playing that sixth string because if you guys remember, what letter is that sixth string? That's an E string, and you're playing the E minor chord, so you're just incorporating another E note into your e, uh, e chord. When you're playing that A sus chord, you're not hitting that sixth string, you're hitting just the fifth string. But what's the fifth string? A. It's an A chord, it's an A uh, note that you're playing on that fifth string. So you're incorporating an A note into this A sus two chord you're playing. So just a little rhyme and reason why that's happening. Um, Paul, when, um... <laughs> Is now a good time to say something about the build of a chord, the one three five, or do you usually wait until later on? Pause that just for a second because I have a question for Baltimore and David. Yep. Related to the E minor, and then I'll answer your question. So, David, you were making an E minor with your first two fingers, and Baltimore, you were using your second and third finger. Yes, and I wanted to point that out too. So, kind of a common question a student might ask is, well, which is the right one to do both are i would say whatever your next chord is <laughs> or what chord you're coming from yeah right so uh, so that's... there is and what we teach in this lesson is we're going to teach you the correct ways of how to finger chords that you're going to find in every beginner book every instructor is going to teach you how to play these chords these ways now going forward you might find later on when you're playing songs or whatever that you're playing a difficult chord before or after or whatever, and you find that transitioning between that chord to this chord, you it might be just slightly easier to use your second and third finger instead of your first and uh, first and second finger, and that all depends. But the rhyme and reason for the way we finger chords is because these three fingers, your first finger, your second finger, and your third finger, are the strongest fingers in your hand. So your first strongest finger is your first finger. Your second strongest finger is your middle finger. Your third strongest finger is your third finger. And so all these chords are built off the idea that you should be using your strongest fingers first before you result to possibly a pinky. But like I said, going forward, you might throw that pinky in from time to time to play other chords traditionally not written the way that they are in these books. So. And I'm going to have I'm going to have Baltimore demonstrate that if you let me use you, Baltimore. Can you make your E minor with your last two fingers? Last two fingers. No, three and four. <laughs> your pinky, three and four. Your pinky oh, my last two fingers. <laughs> and then you're going to strum that, and then you're going to go to an F minor. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So there's your F minor. So it really does, like the guitar doesn't care what's pressing those two notes down. The guitar only cares that you're pressing them on the second fret. So before we all logged on, Baltimore was showing us how he could take his big toe and he could make an E minor with his big toe. <laughs> we won't have him do that. <laughs> he has but nice really legs though. But a lot of times beginning students will ask, like, I think even in our instructor's manual, we show the E minor with the first two fingers if, with and a big rule, but the chord chart shows the second two fingers, you know, and the, and the instructor or the student will ask, well, which is the quote right one? And, and obviously the answers are both right, because it really is about fretting those two strings on the second fret. Or how you practice it more often and you're more comfortable with it that way. I, th I think once we go down the road and we show uh, demonstrate how to play a G chord, that will come into effect a lot more because there is a usefulness to playing a G chord with a, a pinky versus the traditional uh, one, th two, three fingers. And the F chord. Yep. And the F chord. Yep. <laughs> so, so Daniel, we don't um, in the first five hours of ITAG in total, we don't dip our right. feet in a lot of theory. And we don't really talk about the root third fifth and how we construct chords. That's kind of a later beginner kind of thing. Okay. Um, so I think the closest we get to it is last module, we talked about the musical alphabet, I believe, mm -hmm. and how we can use that simple little formula to be able to name notes on the fretboard as well as name notes in a chord. Uh, that's the closest we get to it. Right.
So, you know, for example, the ACES2 that we were just talking about, what the heck does that two mean? Well, in the A scale, the second note is B, A, B. So I'm just following the alphabet. And my A chord, my, if I make my a, regular A chord, the A sus2, sus means it's short for suspended. And that's just another word to say, when you make your A chord, I want to make sure I hear a B note because I don't hear a B note right now when I make an A chord the regular way. So to make a B note, I have to lift my pinky off and now I have my open B string. So that's my bye and goodbye Eddie. So there's my A, no B, there's no B note here. But as soon as I lift that off, I have now an A with a suspended B note. So the suspend, the way I kind of think about it is, I want you to play an A chord, but somehow I want you to get the second note to ring out. So then I apply the musical alphabet, I'll be A, B, okay, that's my B note. Oh, okay, well, that's how I make the chord. Yeah, not to get too crazy into it, but like they said, there's a rhyme and reason why multiple notes put together make a chord. And there's a numbering system to figure out what those notes are to make uh to figure out what those notes would be in a chord um and that can go down you can go down a rabbit hole for a little bit but that's past this class and what we're trying to establish um, and that that is that one of the <laughs> we were talking about uh why you would have your fingers in certain positions these are two good chords to start to learn your transitions the e minor and the a sus too because you merely only have to move them down the scale or down the, the, the fretboard. So what you would do is you uh, want to start out for your transitioning. If you're slow at making the changes, if the changes are getting a little difficult and you want to get into knowing uh, rhythm, getting them one, two, three, four, or whatever your time signature is. But we'll start out with this, the four four time signature. So you're going one, two, three, four. So you would make that E minor one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now chain two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Change one, two. And that's trying to known as what's called uh, hitting on the one. And uh, that's the idea when you're making your transitions, your chord transitions, you want to hit it on that first beat. So during the time you're going from one to four, you've made your one hit. That's when you'll be changing from the E minor to the A sus. Do it again to repeat back for the E minor. It's a great practice exercise for transitioning. Do it for about five minutes and uh It'll make it easier for you to start doing other transitions as you as we're moving up. All right. So to demonstrate that, the hitting the ones, I've got my E minor chord right here. So I'm gonna hit one, two, three, four. I'm gonna go to my A sus. One, two, three, four. A E minor, two, three. Four A sus, two, three, four E minor, two, three, four, and so forth. Practice it like now, that. Now, eventually you'll want to start adding on. So you're going one, two on the chord, transition three, four, all the way up until you're just strumming one, two, three, four, change one, two, three, four. And Any other? And, and for that, you can refer to my video on CavArts. I have a video there on CavArts. He does have, I was just going to say, and Baltimore does have a video on it. Now, in the modules also, uh, in as you're going through each section of the modules, there are videos that you can refer back to, and there's some great stuff in there uh, by instructors and by online instructors. Hey, Dan, about the hitting the ones, um... Just a couple thoughts on that. We know that new students, when they drop out from learning guitar, there's a couple areas when they're first starting that as instructors we wanna look for. One is the callous stage. 
Mm -hmm. The second is chord transitions. So the student will say, I know my, I know my E minor, I know my A sus two, but I can't transition. So this hitting the ones exercise, not only is a way for them to practice chord transitions. And the reason we teach E minor and A sus two, I've often had students when they're taught those chords at 60 beats per minute can hit the threes. So if you think about a 60 beat per minute clip and you're hitting the ones, you have three seconds to get to the A sus two. So E minor on the one, silent two, silent three, silent four, but then you gotta be in place for that next one at 60 beats per minute. So if you're now hitting the twos, you only have two seconds to get to your next chord. And the reason we like the E minor and the A sus two is because the vet, most vets can do that on that first lesson when they learn it and they, they feel a sense of accomplishment. They could hit the twos maybe, they could hit the threes. The idea is as you're progressing with the student and giving them new chords to learn, to tell them to keep that hitting the ones in their routine. And they get to the C chord and the G chord and they feel like they just went back because they can't even barely hit the ones on it because those are really those three finger chords that cross the neck, those are really difficult. So the thing about the hitting the ones, we call it the hitting the ones, but as Dan said, the goal is at 60 beats per minute, if you're hitting all four, that's kind of a very, it's still, kind of a slow strum pattern in one sense, but the student can monitor their own progress. They should move on when they're ready. If they're consistently hitting the threes, they should then start hitting the fours. But then again, when you introduce two new uh, chords for them to put into their routine, they're gonna probably back it off to hitting the ones again, and they, they can use that to mark their own progress from week to week. Well said. Very so good. up until uh, at this point, because we're going to, I guess we're already starting into module three as we're going here. Any questions so far? I yes, Rick. Question. Um, you recommend 60 beats per minute when you're practicing chord transitions? I think it's if a If you're really having a hard time, it. does it hurt to slow it down? Or no. When you do better? No, you can no, slow it down. The, oh, so okay. the, the, the biggest thing is to try to, over time, you'll speed up. But the biggest thing is that you're staying at a constant rhythm and you're sticking to that rhythm. So if you have to slow it down to get you going one, two, three, four, then yet do that. But okay. over time, you just kind of speed it up a little bit and you get a little better at your transitions. And that's how you get to the point where you're transitioning between multiple chords and then playing songs which is what it all amounts to. Rich, it. Thank you. I also want to say, Rich, that question begs the issue that there's a truism when it comes to learning this instrument that you should always, all of us should keep in mind. And that is slow is better when we're struggling. So when Baltimore was showing the chromatic scale and if you're struggling, he said, slow it down. If 60 beats per minute is fast when we're learning chords like G and F and B minor, slow it down. There's nothing wrong because slow is perfect. And then perfect gets us to speed if that's what we're going for or accuracy, I should say. So slow gets us accurate and then we can speed up from accuracy. We don't want to speed up from something that we're still we don't have ingrained into our fingers yet. So that's a great question whether we're that's what you know, I, I can't remember the saying that um, Eddie Van Halen said, you know, he's one of the guitarists that's the fastest around. And he had this whole thing about slow is accurate and accurate is fast. And that kind of makes sense. Good advice. Thank you. All right. So uh, any issues with fretting? Nobody Everybody understand how, how to read the chord chart and what you're looking at. And Everybody understand how to read it. Okay. Well, right. okay. <laughs> I think the next thing we can do is move on to that G, scale, G major scale, unless we'd like to do the E and the uh, A minor, Paul, or the A. Uh, Kathy, was asking, a little bit. Kathy was asking what was the fingering for the easy G chord. Oh, oh the easy G chord. Okay, so um, if some of you guys are following. And in fact, Donnie, if you can share your screen. One finger. Yeah, oh, just this finger right here. Third yeah. fret. 
first string. And when you're fretting, it's also a good practice to get your fingers as close as you can to the wire, but still being able to get that string to ring. So Kathy, um, any of these chords can be made into easier chords, easier fingering chords, usually by lifting a few fingers off. But that question about the G chord is kind of interesting. When we talk about an easy G chord, if we're learning, if we're, I think I said this last time, if you're, if you want to learn a song and there's a chord that's giving you trouble, don't let that stop you from learning an easier version of the chord so that you could still learn the song. So the easy G for me would be, well, it depends on if I'm using a chord progression and where I'm going. So if I want, if let's say I'm bouncing between a G and an E minor, I might just grab the bass of my G. So I'm not worried about this. I'm only hitting really the first two low strings, the low E and the low A, but there's my G bass. Cause then I could just grab my E minor right there. But if I'm on a D chord, I might just put my pinky down and lift these off for my G. So it kind of depends either way or they're easier. You're using less fingers, but it almost depends on either what chord you're coming from or what chord you're going to. So that D one, I mean, if you need a, like a song, there's a really fast transition between a D chord and a G chord. It's just really simple to lift all that up and you know, just put the pinky down. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I mean, yes, we can make easy chords out of all of them. If you're putting it in a chord progression or practicing bouncing between two chords, it almost might make a difference what chord you're you're bouncing across. When you're strumming, do you strum all the strings on the down up? Thank you for no, bringing that, depends that on up. Depends on the chord. Go so, ahead, Dave. I was going to say, uh, with the easy G chord, if you notice, the reason why it's the easy G chord, other than it has one finger on the fret, on the third fret, is what you're doing at that point is the normal G chord, or the usual G chord, would be using these two top strings, your fifth and your sixth string. By li lifting up these fingers and just holding down the third string or I mean the first string on the third fret, what you're saying now is you should probably just strum from the four string downward. That way you're only hitting these four strings of the chord that you would normally finger, which would include the fifth and sixth string. But because you're only holding the finger down on this first string, third fret, you should probably just hit the four string and downward. That way you're not hitting your fifth and sixth string that aren't that don't have notes that are part of the G chord kind of thing. So that's kind of something to be mindful. And this uh, goes into the nuances of, of specific things. Um, like Paul was saying, if there's an easy chord that gets you through a song so you can play a song, totally do it. Now there's also nuances later on when you get a little bit better and you're playing songs and stuff like that where maybe you want your chords to have more bass in them so it's not all high chords well if you're using the small g and you're bouncing from a d to the small g to let's say an a chord afterwards then those are all high notes and you're not having any bass really ring out while you're playing it's just something to be mindful of uh, later on is the dynamics of the sounds of the chords too. But your ear should always be a huge part of you playing the guitar, um, of course. So, Questions? I think we can move on to the, uh, the last part of module three is the G major score scale, and this is going to be a little bit fun. So we're actually playing a musical scale here. And there's nothing really to it. Let me uh, share the scale with y'all here. There it is right there. The G major scale. There is a lesson after that uh, goes through some major scales on guitar, and this guy is really good right here. Uh, so it's 
pretty easy to do. And you're going to actually get up to the fifth fret on this one. So you're only going to be using your sec. You're going to be actually using all your fingers. You're going to have your second, your first, second, third, and fourth finger. And I don't know. Am I showing up? Yep. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. No, we got you. So this isn't a chord chart, just about by chance, people. <laughs> so your second string or second finger is going to be on your first string or the sixth string at the third fret. This is where we're starting. That's a G. Then your fourth finger is going up a whole step. You're going to count two wires up. And that would be an A. So you got right now. And Dan, when you say a whole step, you that you kind of the way you I like the way you describe that. It's kind of one box, then, right? One box, exactly. Every fret represents a half step. When you go and skip a fret, then you're doing a whole step. Okay. All right. So we got two and four. So now it's just your first finger is going to be on the second fret of the fifth string. And that is E. No, I'm sorry. B. That is B. Then C. And then you're going to go up to the fifth fret with your fourth finger. And that would be D. This is all on the A string. So it's B, C, D. So far, we got G, A, B, C, D. You following the pattern now? Next would be, oh, <laughs> sorry, E. And then it's an F sharp. And then G. Daniel, why, fourth, why fourth, yes, sir. Why why are some numbers or uh, why are some circles black and some are red? Oh yes, I was just going to get to that. Paul. This indicates that you just went, actually, just went a whole octave right here within these notes. The red are the root notes. So if this is the mate, uh, the key of G major scale, then it's going to be starting with the tonic, the tonic being the root, which would be G. And again, this G. There's a whole octave right there. So once again, it's two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four. Hey, Daniel. Yes, sir. Uh, on the screenshot that we're seeing, it says if you play it backwards, you can make it sound like. Like, and everybody listen. I was <laughs> getting ahead of me, man. Sorry. <laughs> You're taking my thunder, man. Once again. That doesn't Everybody sound like getting it. That, that doesn't sound like the Three Dog Night song. No, you're right. It doesn't. I thought Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Oh, well, it sound of music, do re mi fa so la ti do. <laughs> No, this is it's Joy to the World, the Christmas song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well then, will you play Jeremiah as a bullfrog for us? <laughs> do you have original? Um, do you have original sound for musicians on, Don? Say again. Do you have a original sound for musicians on? Uh, why well, you're not hearing my guitar? Oh, it should be filtered, filtered a little bit. Oh, did it? Oh, I did have. Oh, okay. 
Hang on a sec. Let me stop share because you can't see. And yes, it was on. Oh, okay. Oh, so sounded like a maybe little filter. Hang on. Better? There we go. There we oh, go. Yeah. oh yeah. So it's That's your homework tonight, folks. Hey, so and that Daniel. diagram, if anybody's looking for that diagram, it is on the CavArts in the module section under module three, and it has the G major scale there for you. So Daniel. So Daniel. So, yes, sir. So, I just want to make one point, because they may they find that, that same that scale, scale written, written in a different in a form, form, with the A string the being the number four. four. Oh, the second position? Right, right. In case they run into the other uh, G scale, the, the number four, that all those number fours are all the open strings. That's right. You're absolutely right. But that would be the second position. This is the first position chord, or first position scale. Uh, so we had a really good... I don't know why, but I'm why hearing an echo. Is anyone else hearing that? I'm not sure why that. Someone has original uh, musician on. It might be pulling echoes because of that. Or somebody else has got it on at the same time. How's that? Is that better? I turned yep. it off. You're good. So Rich asked a great question. Rich, if I had something to give you a prize for this question, I would, because I think this is an, you just gave me an idea for an awesome idea for cab arts. But Rich's question is, in the video, the dude talks about the G major backing track to practice the scale against. So Rich asks, is there one in cab arts? The answer is no. Or what is a chord progression to make a backing track? The reason I want to give you a prize, Rich, is I think we should have a pot, uh, portion in our modules and more that is backing tracks. That'd be very simple to do, and we can we don't have to have a lot of them. I mean, just something that you could put on that is kind of loot for you to practice all of these scales again. So I love that idea, Rich, and I think actually for that module, it would be good to have an audio file that is um, a practice jam track for you to play the do re mi scale or the uh, joy to the world's over um, so i will work on uploading a g backing track your last question is what are the chords to use for a backing track that's a little bit more of a complicated question but obviously we're going to start on g since we're doing the g major scale that's going to be our root and I'll probably just go with the standard one, four, five, one being my root G chord, which means I can G, A, B, C. I could throw a C chord in there as my four. And then a D chord is my five. They call it the one, four, five. That's not that important that you know that. Uh, but I could just loop like maybe some finger picking of a G, C, D where you'd be able, and the beauty of what Daniel showed you, any note you hit, doesn't matter what chord, when I'm on my G chord, <laughs> when I'm on my C chord, when I'm on my D chord, any note you hit in that scale will sound beautiful. You won't hit a bad note. That's right. That's a great idea, Rich. Maybe you get a price next time. Some Beatles picks, huh? How about <laughs> yes, Kathy. Oh, give them a coin. I got a nickel. <laughs> so that that does it for the uh, review of modules two and three. Uh, now's the time to get any more questions out. If you got anything outside of this uh, pertaining to guitar playing, we're here to answer your questions. Yeah, Matt's saying looper pedals are inexpensive. Looper pedals are such a fun way to practice. You're kind of making your own jam track. So if you don't know a looper pedal, kind of listens to what you're playing, 
you you choose usually a stomp box so you would be playing and when you get to your one on your first chord you would stomp on the box and it's now recording what you're playing and then when you get through your chord progression once you'd hit your stomp box again and then now that's just looped so it's continuously being heard and you could you could just play over it and they're they're a lot of fun if you're into creating chord progressions or just making stuff up it's a great way to learn to begin to learn to improvise it's a really good way to learn about just staying in time like so taking that g major scale and playing over a gcd looped part of it is not you don't have to worry about hitting a bad note but you got to kind of still kind of create a rhythm with your individual notes that you're playing so it's a really great way and that's not just true of a looper pedal anytime you're playing against jam tracks or your favorite song that's really what is happening. Now, what's nice about jam tracks or looper pedals, uh, particularly looper pedals, you're only hearing what you're putting into it. Obviously, a jam track, there might be a bass and a drum. And if you're playing your song, there might be vocals and all that. But it's all good uh, as opposed to just playing by yourself. I mean, it's just a whole different experience there. Frank, yeah, you have your hand up, bud? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, why, why the G major scale? Why is that? um kind of first on the list is that the most popular what's the why G major <laughs> frank i don't know that i have a good answer to that it's a, yeah, it's, a it's uh it, it's actually one of the easier uh or one of the ones that you can actually stretch out your hand on yeah i believe that's the reason i think tom said it, it was the choice you guys had made uh for being able to use all fingers all your fingers uh, for to make a scale. Yeah. Actually, let me, um, that's a great question, Frank. I, I guess I, so I wrote the program, so I'm not sure why I chose the G major scale. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was curious. Other, other I mean, I think I, I found... learned the e, e major was my first scale I learned. Well, chromatic and then E major, I think was the first one. That's that's the I open scale. If I could, if I could, um, the G major scale is one of the most common scales that's used in music. That's why. In fact, well, it's called the people's key because of that. Um, there's a along reason. with, along with, uh, the C scale, which, uh, once you guys go through your lessons and stuff, you might learn the C scale is the only scale that doesn't use any sharps and flats. So it's really easy to freaking talk about because this key of C is just C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And that's it. It's real simple to freaking figure out the key of C. Right. Um, but yeah. Really, Frank, what, what I should have written in there, I just looked at how we wrote that ITAG section. Right after we teach you the G major scale, that, that last video of that section is kind of using that scale to learn things like that spice it up. So slides and pull offs and hammer ons, which is a lot of the fun techniques. But uh, what we didn't say in there, we were talking about this before you all logged on that once you learn that G major pattern, it's a pattern that's movable anywhere up the neck. So if you moved it up two frets, you're now playing an A major scale. Yes. So part of what we should be like reinforcing for you is learn the pattern Wherever you start it will be what key you're in, but just that pattern that Dan showed staying on those strings, whatever finger your first finger is on is going to be the um, the key that you're in. So it's it's really about learning the pattern. So if I were to do it differently, Frank, I think when I have students, now this is hour seven or hour eight, and they've shown a real interest in wanting to learn more about single notes and improvising, um, I would probably do a pentatonic scale first because that's only five notes. Then I might show them the blue note because that's only six notes. And then I would lean into the full major scale so they get all seven notes. I mean, I do like what Daniel was saying though too, like, you know, learning the E that's an open yep. scale versus you're using all yep. five fingers for the G major, which I didn't think about either. So yeah, I like that part of it. Yeah, the E minor and the C major scale are almost identical well in baltimore i think if i understood you right um you were saying you could play that g major scale if you move that shift that everything down you could play the g major scale using the open strings is that what you're saying yeah so like the g pentatonic would be three open so if i'm starting with my high e string 
This, this is a great, uh, it's also the E minor pentatonic, which is what Dan's calling. It's the same notes. So don't get confused that we're calling it E minor and G major, but I'm just gonna go three on my high E string open, three on my B string and open, two open, two open, two open, three open. So it's, now I turned my musician sound off because I think I was getting an echo. So let me see if that helps. But it's just 3-0, 3-0, 2-0, 2-0, 3-0, 2-0, 3-0, 3-0. And it's a great blues kind of, because these these two on the three, you could bend and get a little attitude in it. So it's kind of fun. Hey, Paul. Or Dan. Yes. yes. The actual yes. G minor scale that you come up with for the practice is really good because which the guitar students should know as well, the E minor is the relative minor to the G. So they both have interchanging notes. So right. yeah. That's, oh that's yeah. Absolutely. You're gonna find that a lot when you're doing scales, mm -hmm. when you start learning scales. Mm -hmm. That they'll inter they'll cross the uh, lines in, into different keys. And since you're going into the pentatonic scale as well, it's good to let them know what the relative minor to the major chord is all the time because that's what you're going to be playing over. Time. Right. When you, yep, exactly. Good, good. You sound like a G for V instructor, are you? It is. It's DJ V <laughs> over there. <laughs> Any yeah. other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Paul, I have a question. The yes. uh, Guitars for Vets program, the 11 week program, is it a continuation of this or does it start somewhere else? In the That's program? a great question. So um, if you start with ITAG before you get paired up with a virtual instructor, you will be steps ahead and the 10 hours that you get with your virtual instructor will be spent in a way that could take you further down your guitar journey than if you didn't do iTag. To literally answer your question, we took what you see in iTag, it's the first uh, five hours of our program. Okay. Well, of our right. curriculum. So if I had a student that didn't go through iTag, I'd be starting with the parts of the guitar. That was last yeah. week, the open string names. If I had a student that said to me on my orientation with them, yeah, I went through the iTag program, I wouldn't have to spend a lot of time. I mean, I might ask you what the open string names are to see if you remember, but yeah. it's just nice because we could accelerate the learning. 10 hours is not a lot of time on this instrument. It really isn't. Okay, thank you. I was going to say, um, I encourage, and me and Paul were talking about this earlier today. Uh, when you guys finish the program and you do your 10 hours, um, going forward, I encourage uh, all my students to either get a, uh, get a guitar instructor if they really like the guitar after that, or show up every week to my jam group, or show up here to the jam group, the I jam that they do here on cav arts because the biggest thing that uh guitar players are going to run into is you're done your 10 weeks are done you got your graduate guitar and then you play it and pluck around and try to remember what you learned over those 10 weeks and three months go by and you don't have haven't really found that reason to keep picking it up and you put it down and then one day you just never pick it back up again and having something in your life that constantly has you pick it up at least once a week, whether it's the jam group or whatever, it keeps you motivated to learning new songs, practicing, getting better and all that. So uh, if you can put something in your life that causes that to happen, that's hugely important to continuing to learn the uh, instrument and enjoying it in the long run. Hey, um, Ken, I'm gonna ask you if you want to unmute. Ken put in the chat that he's going through uh, classes now. He's at week two, but he took the ITAG class first. Is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah, I started out taking the ITAG classes just waiting because we didn't know, you know, when I'd start. And uh, now I'm so far ahead, you know, we're working towards working on my song that I wrote Good. and, and, and doing, you know, that stuff 
and focusing on that more than having to focus on all of the, uh, the, the basic stuff, basically. You know, your instructor it, loves you too. I guarantee it. <laughs> who, who is your instructor? Um, it's uh, Dan Spiegelberg. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. So uh, I'm going to embarrass you further, Ken. If you don't know, Ken just joined a new society called Fatherhood. He just had a baby. Oh, snap. Or maybe you did know because he posted that beautiful picture of his baby in the CavArts community. <laughs> Congratulations.